recording, so thank you. So, so Nochamo, recognizing that that um, recognizing that uh, um, Paganini was probably the best violinist, and he reached heights that Rossini would never reach, he started crying. He he fell into a fit of self pity. He started crying. Now, what's interesting is is that Paganini was very thin. He was six foot seven. He was an ugly man with very disgusting teeth, eyes that were sunken, long black hair. He looked like a devil. He created what was known as 24 caprices. You could listen to them after whatever your sphere is over. You could listen to specifically, I think, Caprice 4, Caprice 24. These are some of the most difficult pieces to play. You need to have fingers that are so long and that could wrap themselves from beginning to end of the violin and move with speed that could almost create sparks in order to play them properly. And, Pag and Paganini created those caprices, played them to perfection in a way that almost no violinist was able to mimic. There was another thing that he developed and that was called the left hand pizzicato. Most people, when they play violin, so they have a choice. They could take the right hand that has the bow and they could strum the strings and create very nice melodious music, or they could pluck it, and that's called pizzicato. Paganini's fingers were able to do with the left hand pizzicato. He could play the violin and pluck the violin while he was playing it, often sounding like two violins playing at once. This was an unbelievable thing. Kings and queens came from all over to look at him. I think one of the popes called him the angel of violin. Um, it was a unique individual beyond description. He, uh, he, um, he, uh, tall, very frail. And one time he was um, in discussion with one of his biggest rivals. There was a fellow named Carol Lipinski who felt that he was as capable as Paganini and he wasn't. And he came to see Paganini and he studied him and he watched him and he looked at what he eats and he saw Paganini ate hardly anything. And he looked at his fingers and they were thin, they were bony, they were gnarly fingers. He picked them up and he kissed them and he hugged them. And he said, such weak fingers, how could they do what they do? And Paganini looked at him and he said, they're not so weak. And the people around him started laughing because they knew this trick. He had done this many times before. He picked up a crystal bowl and you could try this. Almost no one could do this. He was able to put his two fingers on top and his one finger between them and press until the bowl broke. Lipinski tried to do that for a whole afternoon. He left very, very tired and unable to do that. Now, why I tell you about Paganini, there's something very interesting about him. First of all, this, despite the fact that Pope Leo XII liked him so much, he was denied burial in a Catholic cemetery because it was assumed, and he encouraged these type of rumors, that he made a deal with the devil in order to enable him to play the way he played. So this deal actually denied him the ability, his corpse laid in somebody's backyard out of a grave for six months until they made a deal and they got him to be buried. But here's the interesting thing. Paganini suffered from something that destroyed his life and gave him a tremendous amount of pain. His whole life was wracked with pain and something that would not be diagnosed till the early 1900s. He suffered from a disease called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Today, some people call it Marfan Syndrome. It's a connective tissue disorder. That means besides the fact that the connective tissue doesn't allow us to move our digits to spaces that we can, but it also provides us collagen for so many different things. We're able to see better, we're able to hear better with collagen, our hearts work better, our circulation works better. People without collagen live a pain, pain, a, pain a, a life racked with pain, a life full of disabilities, a life that ends up crippling them. But Paganini, it seems early on, understood that this was a gift. This was not a curse. This was a gift that enabled him to do things no one was able to do. Early on, he spoke of his ability to move his fingers in ways no one can while it hurt and while it cost him, but he understood that it was a gift. To some extent, it's important for us to understand the same idea. Before we even talk about the concept of suicide and Ibu Ratz we must understand that Hashem loves us as hard as, as hard as it is to always internalize that. But Hashem loves us and whatever he gives us to a great level, whatever he gives us, whatever the challenge is, if we could internalize that he's giving it for our growth, 
and for our ability to step higher and higher, and we utilize it that way, we'd never have thoughts that verge on suicide. We'd never have thoughts that verge on self-destruction. Now, saying that, I want to talk about the concept. Now, the, 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 there, were, there, were, there were many cases that sparked tremendous discussion. And I have to tell you that for the most part, even though the halacha tells us that when someone commits suicide, they're buried in the most, we'd say, ignominious spot in the cemetery by the gate, not the special side of the gate where Kohanim are buried. They're buried by the gate where the misfits and the, and the outcasts are buried because we see them as violators. We see them as terrific violators. And these violations are called so strong that it's Ein lahem chelek la'olam haba. We see them as people that lose their portion in the world to come. Yet, it's almost impossible to get the stamp of a ma'abed atzmeladas. We never look at somebody with that light. We always try to figure out why either he was in trouble, why either he was not really committing suicide, he's not guilty of it. We almost never subjugate a person to that type of treatment. And I'll explain the different ways that we get out of it, and I'll explain why we get out of it. Um, first, I'll say a few famous cases and the discussion that they sparked. I'll just talk about two, two three cases. Um, one of them was in Uran. Oran, it's a city in Algeria. So about 180 years ago, there was a very wealthy man. His name was Shlomo Ekris. Shlomo had a brother, a ne'er-do-well, whose name was Yaakov. Yaakov had five daughters, and they always derided his inability to be like his brother. They always challenged him. They held him up against his brother. And his wife, she was no picnic either. She, um, she, she was very difficult on him. He came home one day extremely frustrated and very agitated, and he told his family, if they don't stop bothering him, he's going to drink. It's called Zalmith. I don't know what the substance is today, but it's called Zalmith. I'm assuming that it was some sort of a cyanide. I'm assuming it was some sort of a, of a, of a but in the he Hebrew or Arabic word, it was called Zalamith. Uh, if Yehoash Orange was here, which I don't think he is, he would Google it and he would tell me right away what it is. But um, that's what it was called. It was called Zalameh. Now, now I don't know what it is. Uh, in, any, in any event, it was poisonous, but it wasn't like terribly poisonous. But he threatened them. He said, if they don't stop harassing him, he's going to drink it. They didn't stop harassing him. They called his bluff and he swallowed eight of these pills. He fell ill and um, he was sick for a few days, got better. Then he suffered a massive, it's unclear, but it would be the equivalent of a heart attack. He was um, compromised through drinking some of this poison. He was heavy, he was extremely agitated, and um, his family at this point was very sad. He was a young man, he wasn't, uh, I think he was uh, beneath 40, and his family was very sad, and they buried him with honor and with dignity. They found him a very nice grave and they buried him with honor and dignity. Well, the two Rabbanim in Oran, Oran is again, Northern Algeria, were very um, sad and they went to the Shiva house and they sat there and they were talking with the family and the wife and one of the daughters started saying how this whole death came about and the rabbi is taking notes and they're not understanding why the rabbi is so intrigued. And after, um, you know, the visit, the rabbi sends his, uh, his beadle down, his shamus down, and uh, the family is summoned to the court, and they're told, in no uncertain terms, that the body of this individual, of the body of this uh, Solomon Ekris, is going to be exhumed. He does not deserve to be buried in that position of prominence. The body is going to be exhumed, and it's going to be reburied in a spot that's deserving for criminals the way he deserves. 
and the family is beside themselves. But the rabbis, like rabbis were in that time, they had little, little fiefdoms. The rabbis ruled with an iron hand, and he said it, he meant it, and he did it. They called the Chavra Kadisha, the exhumation happened, and he was placed in an in a, in a, in a area with very tremendous bizarre degradation. It was really horrible. Just reading about it today pains me so much about the injustice. They didn't understand how powerful the brother of Solomon Ekris was. Yaakov, uh, the bro- I'm sorry, the victim was Yaakov Ekris. Solomon is the rich man. They didn't understand how powerful Solomon Ekris was. And they didn't realize how connected he was. They didn't realize how many Rabbanim he knew and how many people he helped support. And he methodically went from Rav to Rav and he told them about the travesty, he told them about the tragedy, and slowly he garnered the support to the point where the son of Rav Chaim Palachi, Rav Avram Palachi, probably the leading um, greatest Sephardic rabbi in the time, put out a book, a strong book called Kvod Yaakov, and it was dedicated to the honor of Yaakov Ekris, and there he wrote scathingly against the judges that exhumed the body of Yaakov Ekris, he called them by name ruffians and people incapable of understanding halacha. He then, um, he then, uh, um, uh, he didn't excommunicate them. He came short of excommunicating them. Not only that, he collected responsa from tens of other rabbis that agreed with him. And this was a very big statement of protest, coupled with the statement of tremendous respect that the Ekris family deserved after being berated and tortured like this. The rabbis in Uran were not gonna sit quietly. They wrote a book called Chazus Kashe. And this was in response, and this was to try to somehow substantiate their ruling and to show that they were right and that they were correct. So here you already have two books that were written about this specific case. Um, Again, once again, the uh, diaspora rabbis, the ones that were judging this, they wrote a response against that which was called Itam Kashot. And that was written by Rabbi Yehuda al-Bali. It was put together by Rabbi Yehuda al-Bali. And this was a rebuke on top of a rebuke to the judges who refused to own up to the wrong that they did. Not only you did wrong, but you refused to own up to it and you're trying to substantiate yourself. So it was another book to further humiliate these judges in Huran. Now they were big people. I'm not going to say they weren't, but they made a very grave error. Now, the whole discussion broke into two camps. One camp said, okay, what's done is done. Let's leave him here. Let's try to make this spot a more important spot. Let's uh, enshrine it. Let's bury people here and make this more viable. Another group said, no, let's disinter him again and put him back into his original spot. So another book was written about that discussion. It ended up, it was a set of four books that was written about the Yaakov Ekris suicide. Now, clearly what came out of that was a tremendous uh, voluminous amount that you don't rush to judge, to judge somebody as suicide. A suicide is somebody that meticulously with a tremendous amount of, uh, I would call settled mind, is taking his own life away, recognizing that it's a gift God gave him. And when there's life, there's hope. And when there's life, there's good deeds. And when there's life, there's good action. And he's throwing all of that to the wind and he's saying, I want none of that. I'm not interested in that. That's a guy who's not judged favorably. That's a guy who God doesn't like. And that's a guy that maybe loses his portion of the world to come. He could be buried with ignominy. But just a guy who's suffering and took his own life, there's so many ways to get out of deeming him a suicide. And I once heard an interesting TED talk. It was, I forgot the guy's name. I think the guy's name was Brick or Bricks. Uh, if you want to, the way you would look it up would be a Golden Gate Bridge suicide. Those would be the words you have to plug in and find it. And primarily, the Golden, Break, the Golden Gate Bridge in California is a bridge that lots of people like to make their final exit from. Uh, out of the people that take the leap, many of them succeed. But there's a large percentage that don't succeed. They, they end up falling to the water, and they're saved after, you know, great efforts are made. This fellow, who was just a bridge keeper, and he was sort of like a, like a Port Authority type of guy, 
decided to do his own empirical research and to ask the people who didn't make the suicide, who didn't work for, to ask them questions that he felt would compile some important data for him. And it was, it was very important data. And it actually conforms with a tremendous amount of halacha. What he found out was 99% of the people who jump, and he could only talk to the people that didn't actually succeed, 99% of the people who jumped, I think that's what the number was, it might have been 98%, the second their feet leave the terra firma, they regret what they did. They immediately, re now, arguments could be made that that's why they survived, because they took different efforts to try to break their fall, all good, all wonderful. The point is, is that this is something that the Balei Halacha have said a long time ago. A person who takes a gun and shoots himself right after announcing, it's over, I want out, this is ridiculous. You could assume that's a suicide. There was no time between the actual declaration and between the action. Then you could assume maybe suicide. You'd have to now see other mitigating circumstances. But a person who has a lot of time elapse, he's going from uh, the top floor of the Empire State, that could take a few seconds, minutes, whatever. That time, 99%, and that's a rave which is amazingly strong, that time that elapses makes him rethink and revisit his decision to the point where he regrets it with totality, and that's considered tshuva. That's considered repentance. And that, therefore, is not a person who committed suicide. That, therefore, is a person that deserves every cordiality that's given to the dead. Now, I also want to point out that um, before we talk about the dinim and the halachas, which I don't think we're going to get to today, but we're going to talk a little bit about um, cases, and next week I'll give an outline of halachas, and then we'll talk about the more important discussion, which is mercy killing and ending a person's life when, when, when he feels overwhelmed by the brutality of the disease that he's suffering. So I want to tell you something along those lines. Just a few ideas, and next week we'll tie it together. The, the, um, I, read about an, I read about an 1803 shipload of black people that were being shipped from what's now Nigeria. Then it was called Igbo. It was the Igbo people that lived there. These were very strong, fiercely independent people. And they um, had a king, they had a leader, a chief, they had a culture, um, very sturdy, good-looking people. Now, they were being shipped by some, a guy who ends up becoming a senator or something disgusting, you know, slave trader. They were being shipped to somewhere in Georgia. Um, it's called Gwyn Creek or Glen Creek right now. I, I haven't seen it recently, but it's called Glen Creek. And they were being shipped there, and they were being kept on the deck, chained one to the other. At some point, the chief understood what exactly their life is slotted for, and he spoke to his um, fellow captives. He spoke in the Igbo language, which was, I think, Nigerian. And he told them that it's better to die than to... It's better to die than to live like a slave. And he told them that the second they have an opportunity, what they should do is um, they should walk out, of the, walk out of the dry land into the water, and the water god will carry them back to their source, something like that. Meaning he was telling them to commit suicide. So 13 of them, while in chains, were able to overpower the white slave masters, they were able to kill three. They then navigated the ship to the coast of Georgia, whatever the coast was, Glen, Glen Creek, Glen, Glen Cove, and um, recognizing that the authorities were going to come for them, recognizing that this was not going to be a life that they wanted, they marched in chains into the marsh, straight into the water, and died there. Uh, it's considered a tremendous act of heroism. They were singing Igbo tunes. I think the place was renamed Igbo Creek. Uh, it was something that was contested by many people. Until recently, there was real evidence to substantiate this story. Again, this was a group of people 
and this is very reminiscent of the Gemara in uh, Gitin Dafnun Zion. A very similar Gemara happened to us as Jews during the exile and destruction of the Second Temple. The Gemara brings down Maisa, there was a story. Four hundred young, beautiful men and women, young children, that were captured with the specific intent of breeding slaves. So it says, Mishahir Gishu Bahen, when they realized what was being sought from them, when they realized what they were Gishu Bahen, what they're being sought for. So it says, Amru, they, they, they asked the Godel Shabem, they asked the older one amongst them, they said, Im Anu. I think if we're gonna if we're gonna drown ourselves in the water, will we marry a portion in the world to come? Clearly, what these young people understood was suicide is unacceptable, and if we jump over the railing, we're committing suicide, and we should technically lose our portion in the world to come. But you know why we're doing it. You recognize we're doing it for the greater good. We're no different than the Igbo people who understood that a life of slavery is not a good life. So it says, You, you got to marvel at the presence of mind over here. You got to marvel at, I, I don't know, every time I read this Gemara, I melt because. You have to understand, these are kids. They were ripped away from their parents. They know what's happening. They recognize the trauma. And all they're worried about is, The eldest one spoke to them, and he cited a Pasuk in Tehillim. He says, Hashem said, I will return you from Boshan. I will take you back from the depths of the ocean. Mi Boshan Oshiv. That means what? Mi Ben Shine Aroyes. A person that's devoured by lions, I'll figure out a way to resurrect him. I'll figure out a way to bring him back and to give him his eternal reward. From those that fall into the ocean and die a horrible drowning death, I'll get them back. Miyad, right away, he piluis atzmam layam. They all dove into the ocean. The whole shipload of kids dove in and killed themselves. And the, the Navi screams, he says, We murdered ourselves for you, God. Every day we murdered ourselves for you. Now, so we understand and we recognize that there's a time and a place where a suicide is not only acceptable, no, it's laudable. This is one of the greatest acts of heroism. We recognize when we read about the Igbo people who committed suicide and understood that this is not the way, and they were making a statement against a, a, a brutal racist country, a brutal racist industry. They were making a statement. We recognize greatness in that action. We don't see any problem in that action, nor do we recognize a problem in the action of these children who are Nishba Lekolen. And similarly, similarly, I always love to bring this out when I talk about these type of topics. Uh, when Begin, who should have been the first prime minister, one of the greatest Israeli statesmen ever, when he was in the 1980s and he finally was rising to prominence and he made the speech that was legendary, it was called the Neuma Chachachim. And it's a good time to talk about it, the night of Yom Yerushalayim. When he made that legendary speech, he invoked the memory of two wonderful, wonderful soldiers, Mayor Feinstein and Moshe Barzani. And I gotta tell you a little bit about them. Mayor Feinstein's father was a Nitzol Shoah. He had come from the Holocaust. He had settled in Israel and it was 1947 and both Barzani and Feinstein were caught by the British for acts of terrorism and they were going to be hung and they were going to be hung, there was a chance that people could get them free. They were charismatic, they were charming, they were good looking. Barzani was an Iraqi, Feinstein was an Eastern European, and they were so passionate about what they did, and they refused to admit guilt, they refused to recant on their actions. They wanted the British to know, this is what we feel, you don't judge us, you don't own us, you have no right to this country. 
and they weren't going to do anything that was against their principles. Poor Feinstein, old man Feinstein, comes to his son Mayer in prison and he says, Mayer, please, all they want you to do is apologize. Please, we lost so many. And he turns to his father and he says, six million? What six million and one? God has room for all of us. At least I'll be making a statement worth making. At least I'll be doing something that's valuable. It'll show them. And his father said, I have nothing to say. Gave him a hug. That was it. It was interesting that these soldiers had an understanding that they weren't going to go. They weren't going to go without harming the British. They had gotten a shipment of oranges. They hollowed out oranges and they were filling it slowly with gunpowder. And when the British were going to come and take them out, they were going to detonate that homemade grenade and they were going to take out all the soldiers with them. They weren't going silently. But unfortunately, a stubborn rabbi who felt he should be there for the last minutes of their hanging decided he wants to come escort them. Let the last face they see be the face of a loving rabbi. They begged him, go home, we don't want you. He was a father of four children, his name was Goldstein. They begged him, go home. No, he wanted to be there in action. So they decided they had to scuttle their plan and they had to take their lives alone in the cell without killing any British, but they weren't gonna hang for the world to see. They were gonna do it on their own. This was not the way they were gonna go out, not with the British. And they, they killed themselves and they left a message that they wanted to do it X, Y, Z way, but they couldn't because of the rabbi, they did it ABC way. And Begin gets up there and it's the night before the election. And he says, last night, the, the, the left, got together in this hall. He's talking to a crowd of people. He says, and they start talking about, he looks at the Sephardim. He says, they talk about you and they say, you're the Chachachim and you're the Vuzvuzim. And who are you? You're going to run a country. He says, but I want to tell you, he says. Two people, one's an Iraqi, the other's an Eastern European. They made statements that resound forever and ever that Israel is ours. Eretz Yisrael is Shalanu. It's not going to be governed by a foreign power. They understood, the Chach Chach and Ashkenazi together understood. That speech, no doubt, won him the election. Now, when we think about the action of these individuals, is that suicide? Vaday not. That's Kedusha of the highest order. So there is a border, and there is what we would call lines of demarcation between what's heroism and what's suicide and what's throwing caution to the wind and abandoning a gift that's yours, which is your life. And we have to make that clear. And Amir Tzashem next week, we will. Um, to, to a great extent, we will. But I'm going to hold it here. I'm going to wish everybody a good Shabbos. Thank you so much for joining me. It's always a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Thank you, Rob. Ah, have a good night, Rabbi. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night. Rabbi, Rabbi, wow. Amazing. Oh. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Good night. <laughs> wow. Rabbi. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, it's Steve. Steve. Thank you, Rabbi. I want to ask you, wasn't it, I heard it was Rabbi Ari Levine. Who no, was, Rabbi Ari Levine was supposed to come, but he got the message. He didn't come. Instead, it was this young guy, Goldstein, who really? should have never come. Oh, boy. Nah, yeah. So to say, yeah, he muddled everything up. And, and Begin, <laughs> I believe Begin is buried next to them in Har Herzl. Oh, that's beautiful. He's, that he said, I thought I want to be, they want to film the prime. No, no, I want to be buried with those boys. Wow. That's beautiful. All right. Is it possible to Goldstein? Wow. Yeah. Not, right. not, it's not Baruch Goldstein. It's a different No, Goldstein. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah but that's, beaut that's a very beautiful postscript. I got to remember that. Yeah. That's, That's a yeah. beautiful post. Okay, my friend. Wow, it goes. And good night, good night. Are we, are we have an eight o'clock tomorrow? Eight o'clock tomorrow and eight o'clock in the evening. Yes. Okay. Very good. Well. 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 Thank you, Rabbi. Good night. Be well. Be well.